looking at these um, tests, these finding reliable men and women, men that will come through. And, and I have to say, you know, ladies, your husband's going to go through them, but you're also going to go through your own tests. Uh, each one of us has to come through until we stand before him on that last day. And uh, your tests will be different to your husband's if you're married. If you're single, obviously, you're going to have a own unique batch of tests in that. But sometimes you're going to watch him go through his tests. Be careful when he's going through his tests that you don't take the side of the enemy and always just defend him. Or pick his side. Be careful. So easy to be offended when the Lord causes someone to be overlooked or to be whatever it is. To take the side of your husband. He serves so hard. They don't know. How could they? Be careful. You in your own little fire then with him. Be careful. And keep your hearts. Keep your hearts. And, and because in some ways you, you can save your husband. Uh, some of our wives are, are good for us. Some of our wives aren't good for us. A good wife is one who's with you, but she'll slap you behind the head when you, when you need it. <laughs> All right. All right. And so diving into the test, and I, some of them overlap, but I do want to mention them as headlines. But obviously the, the, the time or the lack of promotion test. How long, oh Lord? How long? How long? How long? How long, Lord? I feel like my life's slipping away. How long till I walk in the promises? And you've got men like Abraham who gets a promise and has to wait so many years until it looks like it's beyond hope. His wife is... And the Bible speaks literally about her, her woman parts are just, they've, they've dried up. And he's so old. How long, oh God? And God is patient with us. Remember, we're more important than what we do. And so he's not scared to keep us and keep us and keep us. Part of the journey of the Spirit for each of us is, well, I call it the, the shelf test. God does all this work, he shapes and molds, and then he just sticks you on the shelf and he leaves you. And you're watching everyone else getting made and put in the kill and you know, looking beautiful when they come out. And you're like, hello, Jesus, I'm on the shelf. I feel like I've got my shape, but I've just, there's no shine. There's no, and it's part of the journey. And um, I love the Bible because it's so full of the fathers of our faith who had to learn the lessons that we as children of the faith also need to learn. And one of those uh, is, a, is a man called Joseph. And his story is beautiful because he gets this promise, this dream. What's going to happen? His brothers are going to bow down and his dreams of glory. And then the journey starts. And it just, normally when God, I, I need to get to this. When it's very clear what God's going to do, when prophetically you know like you know, be afraid. Because normally God makes it very clear because he knows it's going to be very hard to keep you to get through there. When it's kind of vague and you're not sure what it is exactly, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Because that means it's probably the, the journey will be a bit easier. But um, Joseph knows what he's called to. And then he, 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 everything he tries to do to make it happen, it backfires. He, I mean, he goes literally from his brothers turn on him, the, the pit, slavery, slavery. And he's doing the right thing all the time, and it backfires. Instead of the breakthrough, it, it breaks out against him, and he ends up in jail forgotten. And I'm talking years of his life. And I love what the Bible says in Psalm 105 verse 19 in the New King James. It says this, until the time that his word came to pass for Joseph, the word of the Lord tested him. Until the time it came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. And so the, the promise of God itself will test you. The things that God has spoken of your life will test you. And you need to hold the line. And when you're sitting in a prison somewhere and thinking, why am I here? When I've only done what's right. It's the Lord who put you in that prison. It's the Lord who's working in you to test you, to keep you in the furnace. So don't be hasty. We're told to not be hasty in the laying on of hands. Don't be hasty to bring people through. Because if they're not ready for it, they'll fail the test. God is patient with us, and that's his kindness to us. It doesn't feel like it when you've forgotten, but it is his kindness to you. Because he loves you too much to destroy you. So he's doing everything from his side to try and secure you in a secure place. The submission test. Submission's a hard thing for. 
but it's something we're all called to, um, listening and yielding to somebody else. Um, none of us likes it. But Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 2 verse 9, For to this end I also wrote, Paul says to the church, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. The apostolic here, Paul, is putting a church to the test. This is what I want you to do, and it's a test. Are you going to do the things I've asked you to do? Are you going to be faithful in it? And we're told in Ephesians 5.10 to submit ourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. Our heart attitude should easily yield. We should be easily. We're sheep, man. We're not goats. Sheep follow. Goats butt. And I mean, that word is obviously meaning everything that it says. But. But why? Goats go their own way. And that's never a good thing in the house of God. Um, and so we sheep, um, we easily lead, we, we submit and yield easily. And so even within the teams, you know, you, you've got to come to a point where you are, you, you submit easily, you easily lead. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 14, Paul mentions a man called Alexander who strongly opposed our message. In every church, in every leadership team, there'll be a time when someone will strongly oppose the message or the things that are being done. And the Bible warns especially about these things happen in the end times. 2 Timothy 3, people be, you know, lovers themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, disobedient. And so you've got this language of an end times generation that doesn't like to be told what to do. It wants to do its own way. It wants to, and sometimes we just do because that's what the leaders ask us to do. And I, I remember posturing myself like that as a, as a younger leader and just saying, if you ask for it, I'll, I'll do it. Um... Uh, and the danger is if we don't yield, it's because we don't understand authority. And it's, it's especially so, you know, right now, most of you look up to me because you're not that close to me. Because familiarity breeds contempt. I have grown in leadership. But in the early days of leadership, when I was, people looked up to me as, an early, as a young pastor. And, and they looked up to me and then they came close. And when they get close, familiarity breeds contempt. Even with Jesus, familiarity bred contempt contempt and the disciples are more and more starting to rebuke jesus at the start he's like oh son of god halfway in the journey now you've got this wrong jesus and they're rebuking him and so the dangers on your teams as you come close to your leaders as you come onto eldership at some point you're going to face the test of your own heart why are you right and i'm not why do you think you can always what about my perspective and this is the submission test and you have to go through it don't be one who strongly opposes. Watch your heart. And in Jude 11, we read something, a story of about a man called Korah. And this happened then, and it's written in the New Testament to warn us that it'll happen to us too. Could you put up Jude 11? It says, uh, probably looking at 1.11, it's just Jude 11. It says, uh, it talks about people in the church will rise up, even teachers. And they, he says, have been destroyed by Korah's rebellion the woe to them they've taken the way of Cain this is leaders in the church that are now emerging and Jude's writing to the church woe to these leaders they've taken the way of Cain and what did Cain do he rose up in jealousy against his brother and he killed him and remember Jesus said what you with your mouth you can kill your brother so on an eldership team you'll find somebody rising up with that Cain type spirit and go and and murder the leadership team you speak against them you slander them they have rushed for profit into Balaam's error they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And so now he's talking about leaders in the church that have been destroyed by the same rebellion that Korah did. And Korah, if you go in the Old Testament, was a leader in Israel. In Israel. He's part of Moses' team. And he's a leading man, a leading figure in the community of faith. And at one point, Korah leads a rebellion against Moses, and we read about it in Numbers 16, verse 3. And now remember, this is brought into the New Testament as a warning to us. So we should expect this, and we must watch for this in our own lives. He says this is what happened in Korah's rebellion. Korah starts to rally people against Moses, and he gets 250 of the leading men of Israel. It's like he's got a big chunk of the eldership team on his side. These are the leading men of Israel. Korah has somehow influenced them. And they come and they came as a group. So it's, and this is how it normally happens in the church. We all are worried. We all are. It comes as a group. 
to oppose Moses and Aaron. And they said to them, you've gone too far. This is them speaking to Moses and Aaron. You've gone too far. The whole community is holy. We can all hear God. Every one of them. And the Lord is with them. The Lord's with us too. He's not just with you. Why then do you set yourself above the Lord's assembly? Why do you think you can tell us what to do? Why do you think you should lead us? We can all hear God. <laughs> and he's got the leading men of Israel with him against Moses and Aaron. Korah's rebellion. Jude warns us in the church, this is going to happen in the end times. Men will rise up with that same spirit and say to the leaders, who do you think you are? How can you tell us what to do? I've got the Holy Spirit. I'm a priest of God. But they don't understand their place. They don't understand authority. And so they rose up against Moses. And what happens is, at one point, the ground opens up. And them and their families, their children, are swallowed live into hell. And the ground closes up. They were destroyed by God because they rose up against Moses and Aaron. We don't understand the holy. We don't understand. And again, I, I, there's been, these things can be abused and they have been abused. Men have stood up and made themselves more and over. And that posture is as dangerous of hellfire as Karaz is. Both have to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. But depending on where you are in this thing, you have to pass your test. And I marvel at young David, who's a man after God's own heart. And God even places him under arguably one of the worst kings in Israel, King Saul. <laughs> and God says to him, the prophet comes and says, I rejected Saul. You're the man. And anoints him. And then it doesn't get given to David. David gets tested. And in one of the great tests in the Bible, David is hiding. Saul, David's only tried to honor Saul. He's only tried to lift Saul up. He's only tried to make the house of Saul great. He's done everything Saul's asked him to do. He's never lifted his hand against Saul. And Saul is threatened and wants to kill David. He throws spears at him. He literally chases him away. He breaks promises to him. And at one point, David is, is, is in the wilderness hiding because Saul, the king, is trying to kill him. And hiding from the king, the king's hunting him to kill him Ill illegitimately. David has already been told the anointing is on you to lead Israel. The prophet's called you. He's rejected Saul. And they hide in a cave, and the army of Saul ends up camping right at that cave. And so they're hiding in there, three of them. I think it's three of them. David's one of them. And Saul at one point realizes, I need the toilet. This is in the Bible. And so he sees a cave, and he figures, that's my toilet. No one else goes in there. And he goes into the toilet all by himself. And the king of Israel is made utterly vulnerable before David and his men who are lying watching. And one of the men reaches over to David, if you read the Bible, and says, this is like a miracle. Like the king is in your hands. We all know that the prophet said, you're the man. What's the chance that he chooses this cave with us in it now? This is a work of God. Take his life. And King Saul is in his hands. David could kill him, walk out and say, it's over. I'm the king, the rightful king. But he will not touch Saul. In fact, he does this. He sneaks over to show that he could and cuts a piece of his garment. He wants to show Saul that I'm not going to yet harm you. But then, if you read the, the language of Scripture, he starts to realize even by touching his garment, he sinned. And so he gets up when Saul's down. He comes out later on top of the hill where he can run away quickly. And he says, here's the part of your garment. I had you in my hands. But I didn't. And he actually repents even of what he's done. Shouldn't have done that. And God looks at that and says, oh, man after my own heart. And God eventually orchestrates the death of King Saul. And God brings David through. But David could have grasped, could have grabbed, could have tried to make it happen. If you try and make ministry happen, believe me, God will fight against you. If you try and save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. 
Faith is what he's looking for. Pass your tests. The submission test. The ambition test. And I've mentioned that. And that's a scary thing. You know, the devil's sneaky. One of the things that happened to me as a young elder, I remember coming onto eldership on another man's team. And yeah, the devil was terrible. He used to, he'd get people to come to me and just, he tested my heart so many times. Like, Andrew, when you preach, it's just so much better than the other elders. You're such a better pastor than they are. And it was the devil just trying to puff me up. And, he, and I did get puffed up to somewhat. I did think, yeah, I'm it. I did. Again, the mercy of God. And, um, <laughs> but it came down to this. I realized at some point I cannot have ambition. I cannot. Um, what It is ambition I'm on now. Hey? I, lost my channel. I cannot have ambition for these things. I have to be ambitious for his sake. They gave themselves, and so I became more and more ambitious to actually serve uh, the leader that I was under. I, I'm going to tell you a story on that quickly. Coming back to David. Um, no, I'm not going to tell you that story now. I don't have time. Let's jump to the family test. <laughs> Pass your test. The family test. Man, let me just tell you this. Your mom and dad get married, or you get married, and you're like, yes, God. And then kids, Lord, please give us kids. And God gives you kids. Those kids will test you. And they won't just test you in by being painful sometimes. They will test your love, and they'll test your heart, and they'll test your priorities. In Matthew 10, verse 37 and 38, Jesus said this, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. If your wife, in another scripture, he actually uses, adds your wife to that. One of the other disciples adds the wife to that. It's not in this one. But if you love your children more than him, your family more than him, you're not worthy to serve him. Now, there's a, again, every truth has got to be balanced. We can't abuse our families. Um, we can't neglect our wives and our kids. We need to be good carers of them and, and, and love them. But at the same time, our priority is the king and the kingdom. And in one of the stories in the book of Acts, there's a young man called John Mark. And John Mark, we read um, in Acts 13, 13, we read that he actually left Paul and the ministry because he was missing home. <laughs> and, and Paul believed, Paul believed that what he had done had disqualified him from ministry. And so Actually, Paul then said when he wanted to join them later, Paul said he can't join us because he's not fit to serve the king because he loves his family more than he loves the kingdom of God. And Barnabas, who seems to have more of a mercy gift, starts to argue with Paul because he thinks, no, Jesus is you know, gracious and come on. And, and, and Paul's like he's unfit. And if you read the Bible in the book of Acts, it actually goes on to say they tear, they, they actually see an apostolic movement tearing at that point. And Barnabas went with John Mark off into, I think it was, I forget where it was, one of the islands, one of the Greek islands. And the Bible says, but Paul, um, what is the language is? Paul, I've forgotten, I think Paul picked, takes Silas with him. And Paul commended, this is what it says, Paul commended by the brothers. Barnabas is not commended. Paul is commended by the brothers. And the fact that Luke tells us Paul got the commendation of the brothers means the church believed Paul was right and Barnabas, John Mark were wrong. And we never hear from Barnabas again. He picked the wrong side. And years later, John Mark has been redeemed. And Paul writes as an old man from jail and says, John Mark has actually been a blessing to me now. He's come back, he's repented, and he, and he writes to the church, and he actually says this, I wrote to my letter how you must deal with him, because now Paul's correcting what he had initially said. Not that he was wrong, but that John Mark had obviously repented and got it right. The kingdom is my priority. My wife, my children, they are a priority. They're part of the kingdom, but they're not how the kingdom comes fully. Through the church, as elders, as, as leaders, you need to understand the church is your priority. You've been asked as a slave to serve it. You've been asked to lay down your life for it. Servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, does that, you, not neglecting your wife. If you neglect your wife, you neglect your kids, you're disqualified from ministry. We looked at that at qualifications. 
but your priority is king and kingdom first. Be careful of when your kid's sport starts to happen. And it's on Sunday. Uh, you know, I, I, you be very careful. My little kid's playing second team rugby on Sunday, and it's so important, whatever it is. Seriously, you're teaching your children how to prioritize the king and the kingdom. And I'll never forget one of the great stories, uh, historically, actually, was a guy, uh, Lancaster. He was a, an athlete. It, it, it's, I've, I'm pretty sure I've my notes now. What's his name? Chariots of Fire. The movie Chariots of Fire. Eric Little, that's it. Eric Little. Eric Little was an Olympic athlete. You're talking now the top, the fastest. He was actually the fastest in the world. He wasn't just an Olympic. He was the fastest. And uh, when it came to the Olympic Games, now you understand the Olympic Games comes how often? Once every how many years? Once every four years, as an athlete, you may only get one of those in your life, maybe two as an athlete. He's the fastest in the world in his discipline. And I'm preaching off my notes, so correct me if I'm wrong here. But this is how the story goes. So he's at the athletes, and his strongest race, can you remember what it was? I think it was 400 meters. His fastest race, his world champ, 400 meters. Undoubtedly going to win it. 100 meters, okay, and then he won the 400. 100 meters, fastest man in the world, 100 meters. No doubt going to win it. But he hears they're going to run that race on Sunday. Heats were Sunday. Oh, wow. Heats were Sunday. Qualifying you to run the final race. He says, no, but I'm a Christian. It's the Lord's day. He's trained his whole life for this race. This is the pinnacle of his athletic career. But it's the Lord's day. Can you not change it? No, we're not going to change it. Well, then I'm not going to run it. Because I'm the Lord's man. And he gives up Olympic gold, which was undoubtedly his. He gives up his opportunity at winning that medal, being the best in the world. But he ends up by default running a second race, which is not his strong race, the 400 meters, I think it was. And he ends up winning that and gets a get medal on another day. But I think the priority there is so telling for me. Here's a man who is God. And as our societies become more and more secular, be careful, be careful of the heart priority. Your kids need to see the Lord. They need to love the Lord. They need to put his kingdom first. Sometimes the best lessons you can give them is laying down those little things, those passing moments of glory for a far greater glory that will exceed them all. And let me tell you this, there's no sacrifice you can make <laughs> that he will not receive and reward. So I'm not putting that as a law, but I can tell you this. There comes a point. There might be the odd Sunday that you might feel you can run. It's not a law, but what's your priority? What's your priority? That's what he felt. I'm not putting that on you, but watch your heart priority. And maybe for some of you it does mean I can't. But the Lord looks at the heart. Are you with me? Okay, undealt cycles. Undealt cycles. In other words, I mentioned first divorce, first marriage, end divorce, 50%. Second marriage, 62 or 63%, I forget now. Third marriage is in the 70s. Why? Because people don't deal with their issues. They don't deal with their cycles. So as you go in life, God will bring you to the point. You're kind of moving forward. And then God will suddenly reveal some part of your life that he wants you to deal with. And it will normally be revealed through pain or through difficulty. So remember this. When you're in the fire, there's one of two reasons. You or God. A lot of us just think, I'm in the fire, God's put me there. Maybe God did, but maybe you put yourself in the fire. Because you can also put yourself in the fire. Just don't listen to God, just don't deal with an issue, and, and you'll get yourself into the fire. So now you, you're blaming everyone else, and actually it's, it's you that God's trying to change. Not just, not just to stand in the fire, but to actually be changed. And the fire is there to produce pain and difficulty so that you wake up and go, I'll change. C.S. Lewis once said this, God, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Whenever I'm in pain, I ask myself the question, is this me, God? Am I the reason why this is happening? I don't just presume it's a devil. I don't just presume it's a test. The first thing I ask is, is this me? Are you trying to change something in me? Is there something in me that's not ready for? And maybe I got away with it up until now, but if I'm going to move one degree of glory to the next, then every new degree of glory means I have to become more like Christ and there's some new thing that he's touching. 
So, <laughs> in 2 Timothy 1.15, we read about a man called Figulus. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Figulus. And Figulus, in Greek, sometimes names are mentioned, and they actually carry, um, if you understand the meaning of the man's name, you, you sometimes get a, a key into what was his issue. What was Figulus's issue? Figulus, translated into English, means fugitive. He's a man running from himself, running from his past, running from his issues. He's not facing his issues. He's just going around the mountain like Israel did again and again and again and never breaking through. In Luke 6, 46 to 49, Jesus said this, and this is something, that, hear this because this is a very key truth. When you hear truth, it's a good or a bad thing for you, depending on what you do with it. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts it into practice. He's like a man building on a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When the flood came, the torrent struck the house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck, the storm came, the fire hit, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. All right, so what does that tell us? When my world is shaking, something's not fitting right, one of the first questions I've got to ask is, am I on the rock? This could be a test, or this could be me being purified, made more like him. Um, and if I hear what God is wanting me to learn, and I change in it, then I get out of this place of shaking, and I move on to another degree of glory with another degree of testing. Because <laughs> every new level comes with a new devil. <laughs> it is like that, you'll see that. So, so uh, is there something that I'm supposed to learn? And, I, I, you know, and there's lessons that I've had to learn through the years uh, about my own personality even that sometimes gets in the way of God. Um, and I've mentioned this before, but some of you are new. I remember, you know, leading, um, and my leadership style has always been, I want to perfect everything. So, I, you know, if I'm going to, if I, the guys used to call us, we used to have coffee dates, and they would call it a coffee date, where you'd have a cappuccino, they used to call it a cappuccino. Because if I, if I said, can we have coffee, the guys knew that normally meant I'd seen something in them that I wanted to tweak. So I would say, hey, can we have coffee? And if I asked, people would be going, ugh, because they were going to get a cappuccino, felt like it. And, and to be told something in you that needs to change is always difficult for us to process. And I was quite gentle, I think. I was, I think. I was, I am. But some people didn't feel I was. Over the years, I actually have been quite gentle. And most people would say, those coffee dates, people would walk away and think, I think I just got rebuked by Andrew. Some of them didn't realize they got rebuked, and that was, but, 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 but sometimes as I led, I, I didn't realize always that people process things very differently from me when it came to this type of thing. So I, for me, the best thing you can tell me if I'm doing something wrong is, Andrew, when you do this, this is what they hear, you need to fix that. And I'll go, thank you. Oh, I didn't realize that and I'll fix it. So for me, you can just tell me that. And that helps me to do better and I want to do perfect, so that's helpful. But other people, I would sometimes sit them down and say, man, when you do this, this is what people hear and their world collapses feels like I've rejected them now that I've seen a crack in them. And then they start to feel insecure, and they start to feel that they're unloved, and they start to feel that I'm going to hold that against them, and so they want to defend. And, it, 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 and so uh, at one point, I realized one of the things that God was trying to change me in was, was empathy, actually. The word empathy was literally used when I got, is, is to actually go slow with some people and to love them more. And I, I thought I was loving people when I said, hey, Clappuccino was love. Bro. I could do a lot of things. I'm going to spend an hour trying to tweak you. This is love for me. But they just heard this. You suck. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't what I was saying, but that's what they were hearing. And so I've had to try to learn, okay, this thing, if I don't fix this thing, this is going to get in the way of what God's got for me. And then it manifested even into the Americas and into Europe. Because each culture has its own challenges. So as you grow in leadership, you'll find you'll get things. In South Africa, you'll get away with things that you won't get away with in England or in America. 
Their cultures are different. They have a different stronghold. So here we hear you. you if I say this, you can't do it. What do you hear? But you're kind of hearing it like, it's not like, you, 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 you will not do it. You're not hearing that, eh? You're hearing, don't be stupid. It's not a good thing to do. I would never do that if I was you. That's what you're hearing. But that, that in English and American is much stronger. And so without even realizing that you're going to a nation and you're ministering into a nation and you're losing people's hearts because they're getting lost in translation. And until I learn, so, and so I'm wondering why I'm not bearing fruit in those contexts. Why am I hitting a wall? Are they just stubborn? Are they rebellious? And then I realize, no, actually the problem is me. I am saying the truth the wrong way. I have to say it in a way a spoonful of medicine makes a medicine. A spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go around. I've got to find the sugar that makes them want to take the medicine that I'm giving. And so I have to learn. I have to tweak. I have to change. And if I don't change, 412 will stop its growth into the nations because I'm getting in the way of what God wants to do. And so all the time I'm trying to learn, how do I do this, how do I do this better? How do, I, how do I fix this? And so I will deal with my cycles. I don't want to just say, well, and this is what you end up doing. I'm the prophet, and they're just rebellious Israel. I'm the watch. And you find all these people with these weird spiritual reasons why they're right and everyone else is wrong. Actually, at the end of the day, I just did that badly. I wasn't building well in that context, and I need to learn how to build better there. These are the things that we need to learn to deal with. Both sin issues, if you're not dealing with sin in your life, you're going to get stuck. Pornography will keep you for the rest of your life if you don't break it. Short temper will keep you for the rest of your life if you don't break it. I could go through each and every one of these sins. Deal with things and move forward. All right. I want to touch, I'll, I'll bring this to land soon. Idolatry test. I mentioned 2 Timothy 2.17, Harmanius and, and Philetus. Harmanius, his name means son of Hermes, born of Hermes. There's a man who probably has an issue with an idol, something in his life that he loves more than Jesus. And there's a lot of things that can vie for your attention. You know, a sport at one time vied for my attention. I never forget as a young surfer, I, my whole identity was surfing when I got saved. And then I get saved, and the Lord one day says to me in worship, You love surfing more than me, lay it down. Like for a day? No, lay it down. And I remember feeling so naked. I felt like he took everything that my, my whole life was that, everything. That's what I did. Take it away. I mean, I was competitive. I was, I was one of the top surfers in the world at that time in my discipline. You're going to take that away from me, Jesus. And I'll never forget this test. And I, to be honest, I just, I just ignored him at first. I was like, I don't, this is too much. You're asking me too much. I know you love me, and I'm just going to. But I remember sitting at the back, and this started happening to me. I remember sitting at the back there one day, and I suddenly thought, yeah, there's sharks here. I wonder what will happen to me if a shark chows me while I'm living in rebellion to God. And suddenly I started like, ooh, hot. I don't know if I, I want to die like that. And then Steve Cross, who's actually a Josh Jenner today, has, gets, God tells him he's here. Steve, Steve, Steve at the same time comes and he says, we, we are a bunch of young surfers. Steve says, we're all like, God's telling us to lay down surfing. And Steve's like, God tells him that, but he doesn't. He doesn't do it either. And a prophet comes to the church. A prophet comes to the church, international, and calls him out in the meeting that I'm in and says, you're going to stare the jaws of death in the face twice, but you will survive. And to be honest, I didn't actually think shock when that guy said that. I just figured... <laughs> I just figured, whoa, that, that's not a cool prophecy. But it wasn't long after that that Steve was surfing. And a great white shark, I think it was a five-meter great white, if I remember right, comes at him. He's sitting on his board. It comes at him. He sees it. He says, it looks like it's a huge ray coming towards him. The next thing is coming up at him. He puts his hand in to try and, and it bites onto his arm. His arm is in the thing's mouth. Now he's up in the air. My other friends are watching this. He's punching the shark with his one arm and the other arm stuck in its mouth. I kid you not. It thrashes underwater. One of my, everyone bells on the beach, good Christian friends, except for one guy. 
call Walter and he's still in PE. Carl, Carl, Carl tries to paddle over it up, but he realizes, I think the shock smacks him, and at one point he's just, now Steve comes up, it's clapped. He's, it's, amazingly, how's this? You stare the jaws of death in faith twice and survive. Somehow that great white shark has bitten something just before it tried to bite him. And where his arm went in its mouth, it had bitten something that had broken its teeth just in that part. Because they break the teeth and then the new ones come out. Before the new ones came out, his arm went in that hole in its mouth. And so it bit through there and it bit through there, but it didn't sever his arm. But it did clip his artery. So now he's bleeding out at the back. Carl gets with him and they start trying to paddle in. He's just blood pouring out. And everyone else on the beach is praying. And as they watch, you're going to stare twice. You're going to stare at the jaws of death. As he, <laughs> they're paddling like this, and suddenly the guys see this fin pop behind them, coming towards them. And it's running off to the blood trail now, and they're paddling as fast as they can. And the guys watch the shark lunge at him. And as it lunges, they catch a swell, and they accelerate. And the shark bites, and bites his leash, like 17 centimeters behind it, bites right through. You can actually see, I saw the leash, where you can actually see where the shark bit. So he accelerated out of its mouth, escaped the jaws of death, and gets to the beach, and one of them, Carl was a medic, they bound his arm up with the tourniquet, and, and he survived. <laughs> and I'm living, and I'm living in rebellion to God on surfing. <laughs> and I'll never forget the one day I was sitting at the back, and I'm like, oh, flip. And I remember actually thinking, it was so uncomfortable sitting there, I actually stopped enjoying surfing. I just thought I'm going to die at any second now, and I did not look good at that. And I stopped surfing, and eventually for six months, I laid it down. And I realized my whole identity started to change. I became a Christian, not a surfer. And I remember the one day in worship, worshiping the Lord. I understand my whole life, my day, everything was surfing. I'm worshiping the Lord in worship. And now I'm just, it's gone, I've, I'll never surf again. And the Lord says to me in the worship, at the end of this meeting, go get your board. I've dealt with it as an idol. It's now a sport. But watch, watch, that it doesn't become more. And I learned to deal with my idols. Otherwise, I'd be living in Indonesia on a yacht. <laughs> so where some of my friends went. <laughs> Even ministry can be an idol, guys. Abraham gets given a promise. Your son nations. And God comes and says, you know that, that promise that I made you? I want you to kill it. This is a test that God will put you through. Will you lay the knife into your ministry? Will you kill it expecting it to, you know? <laughs> and here's the scary thing. Prophets don't help us in these times. Be careful. I'm a, I love prophecy. I don't want to despise prophecy, but I'm also scared of prophecy. Because the Bible tells me that sometimes prophets can, can say things in, with a well-meaning heart that actually damages me and actually sets me up wrong. And I need to say this because while we love prophecy, I will never, ever follow prophecy. Because every time I did it backfired, I'll follow Jesus and I'll fall into the promises of God in prophecy. But in Deuteronomy 13 verse 3, Listen to this. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer or dreams of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So now God says sometimes the prophet's going to come and he's going to use prophecy to test you. He's going to use prophecy to test are you really dead. And another scripture is Ezekiel 14, 3 to 4. Do you have that one? Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts. Woo. And put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? In other words, if you come to the Lord and you've got an idol, and this is the danger. You think of a lady that desperately wants children. Be careful it doesn't become an idol. God, I want this. Everything is just, give me a child. Give me a child. My whole identity is now being tied up with this promise, this child, whatever it is. Or this, prom this ministry promise. Give me this promise, God. Every time you're there, you're wrestling with him. It's an idol. Therefore, speak to them and tell them. This is what the sovereign Lord says. When any Israelite sets up idols in his heart and puts a wicked stumbling block before his face and then goes to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him in keeping with his great idolatry. I'll tell him what his itch ears want to hear. I'll use it to test him. So when you come and the prophet calls you out, be careful of 
if you've got something in your heart, because the Lord will cause him to prophesy into the idol of your heart. And I've seen that happen a lot. I've been through that. I don't follow prophecy. Prophecy can confirm, but even when it comes, I'm going to weigh it carefully, Lord. Is this something that I really want, Lord? Because if it is, I'm scared to. You need to be very clear. You with me? Don't despise prophecy. It's a beautiful gift. But deal with your heart. I need to land this. Let me land with this. Um, unreal expectations. As you come into team, as you, as you come into any area of life, you have a, a set of expectations, what that would look like, what does that mean, how will it work. And the danger is unreal expectations it becomes a test to you because a disillusionment, which is the result of unmet expectations, starts with an illusion, a wrong understanding. So often you'll have an idea of how you think it'll be. I'm coming onto the team and I'm going to get close to Mike and he's going to disciple me and he's going to train me personally. I'm going to be like a Timothy with a Paul and, and TMT and, and this is how it's going to work. And I can see, and, and what you do is you actually have an expectation now of how you think it must work. And so you, you, you get that moment, you do your TMT and now, but it's not like you thought it would be. And so you actually were birthing this thing in an illusion. And so you end up in disillusionment. Remember this, you don't know how it should work out. You don't know how the Lord's going to move the king's heart. You don't know whether the Lord's put you in the wilderness to be tested. In fact, I, you don't know. You don't know if God's even turned your brothers to turn against you and say horrible things like he did with J Joseph and his brothers. You don't know. You just have to keep yourself in him and pass your tests. In Proverbs 13, 12, this is my last, we, we're landing on this last one. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. So if you have a hope in your heart, you have a dream, you think this is what it should look like, and you hold on that too long, it eventually makes your heart grow sick. So I mean, why have they not recognized? Why have they not? You've got an unreal expectation. And your expectation could be of God, of the team leader, you'll feel let down by him, of the team, they're all against me. You'll feel that at times. Feel like everyone is against you. And sometimes everyone is against you because of you. <laughs> uh, uh, serious. Sometimes everyone is against you. Sometimes they're fighting you because it's you, and you've got to let God teach you what you need to learn in that moment. And the dangers we deflect, we, we, we. I'll tell you a true story and I'll finish with this. One of the areas of where I was, one of the first times that I was spoken to by my own team, I always was under men, and when they spoke, I yielded and listened. And then I planted Josh Jen, and so I was still listening to them, and they could speak into my life. But we planted the church. Russ is an elder, Mark's an elder. I just, I've got about seven or eight of them. I think you were also in that meeting, eh? and Phil. So some of the guys here, Mornay, Mark, Mike, Phil, are still. Uh, and so one of the elders said this to me Andrew, you've got this terrible habit. I think it was, was it? Grant had said this to me. Russell, Russell said this to me. Russell said this. Russell Fraser, my first older. Thanks, bud. <laughs> Stab in the back. Russell says this to me. In an elders meeting, Andrew, I feel like it's really hard sometimes to challenge you on some things because your brain is very sharp. You're very clever, and you've got this lawyer's way of turning things around that I think there's something in you that God's trying to touch, and, and, but you suddenly turn around like I'm the one who's, who's wrong. And I, I remember listening to this and I thought, yeah, you're saying that because I can see the crack in you. And so, <laughs> so I'm, I'm hearing, I'm trying to be humble on the outside, but inside, this is what I'm thinking. Yeah, but the Russell, this is your insecurity. This, I'm doing this. I'm, I'm deflecting. And then I said, well, Russ, I don't see it, so we need to submit this to the team. And I'm expecting the team's going to go and run, Russ, this is your issue. Bring it to the team and submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. So I said to the guys, guys, what do you feel? I think it's Russell's issue. And I know as I'm saying this, I'm kind of playing into exactly what he says, but it feels like he checkmated me and I can't lead him like this. And then one of the other elders said, actually, I feel like that too sometimes with you, Andrew. I was like, oh, these guys have been speaking. <laughs> this is like Korah's rebellion going down right here. I can feel this. And then another one, I'll say, it, you do do that sometimes. And of the whole team there in that meeting, the only one that said I didn't do it was Philip. 
my faithful son. I have no one else like him. But the problem with Phil was he loved me so much, I knew he could see no wrong in me. So I couldn't. It's like, oh. And I, I remember just struggling with the sense of like, I, I can't, I can't, I honestly can't see what you guys are saying. I, I, I think you're all wrong, but the fact that you're all, there's so many of you saying this, I must be wrong. I just can't see it. And I remember grappling with that in my own life, just thinking, how do I, how do I, help me then? How, when do I do this? Help me to understand. But my posture changed from you're wrong to, okay, I'm wrong. I, I, I own it. I don't know why I'm wrong. I don't see how I'm doing it, but if you're all saying it, it must be true. And one by one, they spoke in, and it was about 40 minutes of trying to explain. And then I realized at some point, okay, I do do that. I do do that. And I've had to try and adjust that area in my life. The danger is what I did. I see so many of you do. That when someone addresses something in you, you dodge. And you justify. And you find reasons why they're wrong and you're right. And you can't always lean on your wife because sometimes you're the knight in shining armor or your husband because when the team speaks like that, post your heart right and realize if there's three or four brothers who love Jesus, who are mature in the faith, saying the same thing, the chances are you've got something in you that God's trying to deal and process. And you have to come through that process so that you can be more like him. Blind spots are blind spots. And if you want to walk in the promises of God, you're going to go through many of these trials and many of these processes. If you think you can stay the way you are, you'll stay where you are. That was quite profound, actually. I've never said that before. <laughs> it's like one of those, like, it's like a willism coming from Andrew. <laughs> I must remember that one. I, what did I say now? <laughs> <laughs> it is a profound truth if you stay the way you are you'll stay the way you are you'll stay exactly where you are you'll never walk in the promises of God because it's from one degree of glory to another and you must come through you must pass your tests and I really you know here's the thing we need you to come through we need more elders we need more leaders we need more we need more leaders all over the world but you must pass your tests we can't give you what God has not given you. And so whatever tests and the things that you're going through, pass your tests. And realize the rest of your life, you'll face these. You're never going to go. You can finally say, oh, I'm over the finish line when you die. But for now, we run our race. We beat our bodies into submission to win the prize that Christ has called us to. So that we can all hear him well say, well done, good and faithful servant. And so I really want to encourage you. Don't grow weary. Don't lose faith. You still got oxygen. Be faithful and trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. He is able to do immeasurably more than you can dream of or imagine. He's able to bring you through into all the promises that he's made of your life. And if you reach him with something that he hasn't promised you, you don't want to walk in that because that'll kill you then because you won't have grace for the task. He's a good father, faithful friend, and he'll bring you through. But you must remain in him, and he'll remain in you, and you will bear much fruit of the Father's glory. We need our teams to come through. We don't need wolves. They do damage. We don't need people to fail. We don't need you to fail. I believe Jesus would be reaching out to each of us in our times. And the Bible says he lives to intercede for us before the throne room of God, which means even as you're in your test, the Lord Jesus is praying for you. Father, bring them through. Father, send your angels. Don't let them fall. But you must pass the test. You must come through. And realize when you're in the test, and I'm finished. When you are taught at a school, your teacher is close with you, and you're like struggling, and they're explaining how maths works, and it's, it's all like great. And that, you know, I'm a little bit stuck, and they'll come and explain it to you. And it's like, oh, it's awesome. But when you come to your time of testing, where the Lord wants to know if you've learned the lesson, the teacher's not there helping you. The teacher pulls away from you. And you're left all on your own, looking at this paper that makes no sense. <laughs> and that's what it feels like when you're in the test. The Lord Jesus is not close. There's not a sense of peace and joy and hoo -hoo -hoo, the Lord's close. You feel like you're all on your own. Your perspectives are shouting, your mind's spinning. 
pass the test. Pass the test. Because God's got greater things for you to walk in. Father, we see our big brother Jesus. He came through and persevered and, Father, won the prize, won that which you called him to. He said at the end, it is finished, for he had run his race, Lord. And I pray for us, Lord, that when we come to the end, that we also will say, it is finished. We've run our race. We've won. We've done that which you've asked us to do. Father, I pray for each one here that you'd bring them through and those watching. Bring them through into their great destiny in Christ Jesus. Thank you that as your sons and daughters, you've got them in your hands, God. They're not on their own. That you are faithful to finish the work you started. Give them faith to hold the line and to come through. That from among us, Lord, not one would stumble. Not one would fall beyond repair or redemption. But that each one would come through, Father. I ask with you, Jesus, even in this moment, for each one. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.